Losing that championship game to David Arnett was devastating for me. I was forced to confront some very real issues as a young child. I guess I went through as close to what an eight-year-old can have to an existential crisis. First of all, if I was a winner in everyone's eyes because I always won, did this big loss make me a loser? Had I let my friends down, my family, my teacher? Did I really love chess? Was I just enjoying the glory of winning? Fortunately, I have a wonderful family who helped me navigate through this rocky patch. I took a short break from chess and then returned with a much more mature relationship to the game. Now I was more patient in my chess study. I was self-motivated, worked hard, took on my weaknesses, studied complicated endgames with my teacher. I came to really love the beauty of chess. Now that the pain of losing was part of my reality, I had a much more organic, human relationship to the game, and I was a boy on a mission. After a year of hard work, it was time to go back to the Nationals. While in the previous year I'd felt unbeatable, now I knew I could lose. And there was one kid I was afraid of. His name was Jeff Sauer, and he was a chess machine. Jeff didn't go to school. His father was an authoritarian who pushed Jeff to study chess 12 hours a day with various grandmasters. He was a brilliant, severe boy, fiercely aggressive, filled with disdain for other children. Jeff usually had a shaved head, and he would scowl across the board and chant, kill, 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 under his breath. Needless to say, Jeff was an intimidating rival. We were hands down the top two kids for our age in the country, and of course, in the last round, we were paired up on the first board. This game was the basis of the climactic scene of the film Searching for Bobby Fischer, and it's the first time the actual endgame has ever been published. I had had harder opponents throughout the event, so I needed to draw this game to win the championship. Jeff had the white pieces, a small advantage that was made larger in our matchup, because his openings with white were very sophisticated and incredibly aggressive. I played knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4. This is called the king's Indian defense, d6 to prevent e5, and here Jeff played f4. Right from the start, you can see his aggressive play. Jeff has an amazingly intimidating four-pawn central phalanx. I castled. He played knight f3, knight bd7, and e5. Once again, I want you to put yourself in my shoes and think about the psychological side of this battle. My opponent is the only kid I'm scared of. The year before, I lost an absolute heartbreaker. We're playing on the top board, and soon enough, we're the only two kids left in the playing hall. We sit on a stage, alone, with a camera that's relaying the position to hundreds of players, coaches, parents, and fans in the hotel lobby. We're children, with the world on our shoulders. In this kind of situation, momentum can be very important. When things are going well, suddenly the pressure eases off, and you feel strong, powerful, like you belong. But when things start to go wrong, demons can slip into the mind. Is he better than me? What am I doing here? Can I really do this? And Jeff has taken the initiative right from the start. After e5, I played knight e8, retreating. This position is perfectly fine for black, but psychologically, Jeff has taken the upper hand. Bishop d3, and now c5. I challenge the base of his pawn structure. Counterattacking. He played d takes c5, knight takes c5, and bishop c2. This is a good move because usually in open games or semi open games, bishops are a little bit stronger than knights. So bishop c2 is avoiding the trade. Knight takes d3, queen takes d3. Here my knight is well placed on c5, and I stopped the move b4, which could kick out the knight, by playing a5. This move has the lone purpose of cementing my knight's position on c5. He castled. Here I played b6, preparing to fianchetto my second bishop. A fianchetto bishop is like this one, on g7. Here I was feeling the pressure on my position, and on my mind and I decided to relieve the tension. One thing you'll notice over time as a chess player is that the ability to maintain the tension is often more important than the chess position itself. I played the move d takes e5.
Another option would have been knight c7. He can't take my pawn on d6 because it's pinned to his queen on d4. And my next move can be knight d7 to e6, continuing my development. This would have been an option. But I played d takes e5. He played knight takes e5. And I played queen takes d4. I was very comfortable in the endgames. And this was also a principal decision. Because usually, if your opponent has a positional advantage, a spatial advantage, and they're crunching you, trading material can ease the pressure on your position. A rule for you to remember is this. If you're ahead in material, trade down. That will actually increase your advantage. If you have a positional advantage, a spatial advantage, don't trade down. So here he has a spatial edge. He's trying to squash me slowly. So trading queens, I thought, might relieve some of the pressure. He played bishop takes d4, rook d8. And now Jeff made a very concrete decision, a specific decision. He played bishop takes c5. From one perspective, this violates a rule. This is an open game, and a bishop was usually a little bit better than a knight. But his decision was very strong, in fact, because what he recognized is that my pawn on c5, after b takes c5, would be a weakness. And that became a weakness he lasered in on. He played knight a4, and here you can feel it. Things are a little bit wrong. If I play the move rook c8, defending my pawn on c5, you see what white can play? Think about the space left behind. What's white's best move? That's right, knight d7 is a very strong move. The rook on f8 is hanging. It can't move. It's trapped in there. It's smothered by my own pieces. So in this position, in order for me to defend my pawn, I have to take his knight on e5. I played bishop takes e5, f takes e5. Now I could have played rook c8, but I decided not to. The problem with a move like rook c8 is that he has all the development, everything to play for. He plays rook c to d1. His next move will probably be rook down to d7. Another important chess principle to think about is the rook is very strong on the 7th rank. My first teacher, Bruce Pendlefini, used to tell me that a rook on the 7th rank is called a pig because it can just pick off all the pawns, eat everything. So you can think about that idea. A rook going to the 7th rank is always a very strong thing. Two principles of rook development. One is the rook belongs on open files. In this case, after rook a to d1, the one rook on f1 is on an open file, and the one rook on d1 is an open file, as opposed to my rooks, which are on c8, defending a pawn, which is depressing, and my rook on f8 is trapped. You can see why white has a very strong game here. So in this position, instead of playing a passive decision, like rook c8, I decided to try an active chance. I played rook d2. My idea was very specific here, and I made a pretty deep calculation. I'll show it to you. Now I'm bringing my rook to the 7th rank, which looks very active. If he moves his bishop, for example, do you see what I had in mind? Rook takes g2 check, right. A very strong move. His king has to move to h1. And now, in this position, I have forced mate in two. What should you play here? Excellent. Very good. His king can't move to g1. He has to block with rook f3. And now, of course, you see mate in one, right? Good move. Bishop takes f3. Checkmate. This would have won the game right away. So after rook d2, obviously, he couldn't just move his bishop. He played rook f2. Of course, I had seen this. My idea was to trade off these rooks and then activate my rook by opening up the center or by forcing him to weaken his pawn. I played rook takes f2, king takes f2, and f6. So 
So in this kind of situation, where my opponent has an advantage, I have a very weak pawn on c5, what I've tried to do is make the position very specific. I'm trying to activate my rook on f8 with tempo. I played rook d2, I gave up my rook that was on the open line to trade down, bring his king into an open file. f6 tries to open it up. So if you were to play e takes f6, then I can play either rook takes f6 check, or better yet would be knight takes f6. This indirectly defends my pawn on c5. Do you see how? What if he plays knight takes c5? What should I do? Excellent. Now look at that move. It's not only a discovered check opening up a rook's attack on the king, but also knight e4 is attacking the king itself. This is called a double check by discovery. The king has to move, getting out of the check of the knight and the rook, goes to g1, say, and then knight takes c5, I've won a piece. This would be fantastic. So in this position, after knight takes f6, you see indirectly I've defended my pawn on c5, and I'm threatening discoveries, so he'd have to move his king. If he plays king e2, moving into the center of the board, then he's given up his pawn on g2. Bishop takes g2. That king was defending that pawn. Of course, king e2 would be based on a good chess principle, which is activating the king. In the end game, we want the king to be in an active, central position. While in the middle game and the opening, we want the king to be safe in the side of the board, protected. This switch of roles from protecting your king to suddenly using it as an active fighter in the game is a delicate one, and it's a very important one. Usually people who are great endgame players understand the power of an active king. In this particular case, the king has to defend the pawn on g2. King goes back to g1. And now I have a lot of options. I can defend my pawn with knight d7. I can play rook to c8 to defend the pawn. Or I might even consider giving up the pawn to play for activity. There are a lot of options here. You see, I've opened up the game with f6. But of course, Jeff is a very strong chess player. He's not going to go into that. He played the best move, and it was one that I saw. He played e6. This was the critical position to evaluate. When, In fact, when I played bishop takes e5, we had to see this position. My idea was, I knew that he would win the c5 pawn. But I thought he'd be unable to defend his e6 pawn later. For the rest of this game, I want you to put yourself in my shoes. My fight is your fight. Obviously, my opponent has an advantage. I have pawn weaknesses. He has better development. He has a very strong bishop eventually coming into the game on c2. His rook's going to be coming to d1. We have to defend. We have to use all of the resources we can find. After e6, what do you think I did? I played knight d6. Initially, you might think knight c7 is the best move because it immediately targets the e6 square. And here you can play knight takes c5 with tempo against my bishop. And he has all the activity plus a pawn. If I play bishop c8, he can play a move like rook e1, defending the pawn, or he could also consider rook d1, giving up the pawn and taking a lot of activity. I didn't want to do that yet. I played knight d6. He played knight takes c5, and I made the decision rook c8. This was the key to my calculation. I was willing to give up the bishop, which was tricky, because after knight takes b7, knight takes b7, which is what he did, I recognized that I could pile up on his e6 pawn with my knight, with my rook, and eventually with my king by making the moves king g7, f5, and king f6, and he wouldn't be able to defend that pawn enough. We'll see that in a moment. Knight takes b7, knight takes b7. He defends his c4 pawn by playing b3. Knight c5, rook e1. Now I played rook c6, piling up on the e6 pawn one more time. He played bishop e4. And now, can I take the pawn on e6? No. Rook takes e6 would have been a big mistake because he can make the move bishop d5, pinning the rook to the king. Now the rook can't move, it would be illegal because it opens up attack on the king, and if the king moves, he can take on e6.
If I play the move knight d3 check, this can be a little tricky because now I have a counterattack with a fork. But do you see what white should do here? Your instinct might be to go to g3 to get out of the way of the knight and the rook. The truth is, though, that the best move is king f1. Defending the e1 square because he can't take it with the rook with check because it, the rook is pinned. This is the kind of tactic you often have to think your way through when you're in trouble in a position, or in any chess position. And after he takes on e1, do you see my idea? Now I can play bishop takes e6 check. The king moves, and now we see why the king came to the f1 square. King takes e1 and whites up a piece in winning the endgame. So, if you go back, after bishop e4, Rook takes e6 would be a mistake because of bishop d5, and the tactics are very good for white. The key is that in this position I had seen that I could play the move rook a6. And in fact, I had seen this position when I played bishop takes e5. When I had to look at this position initially, he had this attack on the c5 square. I decided I could gain counterplay with the variation bishop takes e5. This kind of resourceful play is at the center of defending bad positions, and you can see I'm one year older than that last game. that You saw me lose to David Arnett, I got into a little trouble, and then fell apart. Now I'd studied chess a little bit more deeply, and I had dealt with losing. I didn't have a perfectionist relationship to the game, and so I was willing to struggle, to deal with the problems he threw at me, one after the next, after the next. So here I did a deep calculation, worked my way through, found this interesting resourceful kind of counterplay. So now if we continue to the position we're at, the critical move in this whole calculation is a quiet move. In this situation, to go into this, I had to see that I couldn't take on e6 because of bishop d5, but after the move rook a6, this is the key. He can't defend his e6 pawn because after bishop d5, you see what I had in mind? What's black's best move? Excellent. Very good move. Knight d3 check, working the king and the rook, and I win the exchange, meaning I win rook for knight. He plays king f1 or king e2. I take on e1, king takes, and now I have a rook for a bishop and pawn. I'm fine. So in this position, I'm threatening the e6 pawn, and he can't defend it. He can't play bishop d5. My next move can be possibly knight takes e6, but more likely just king g7, getting out of any potential pin. Next I can play f5, king f6, and then I can take the pawn. No problem. That kind of quiet decision in the middle of a long calculation is difficult, but it's often the key to keeping your game alive when you're under pressure. You see, when people have winning positions, they often calculate very well in tactical variations. They see, if I do this, 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 they're looking very hard for quick wins, forced variations but they might overlook a subtle defensive nuance, like this, a quiet move. Keeping the attack on the e6 pawn and eyeing the d3 square. Now his bishop had to move back to c2. Black to move here. I have a few choices. I can take on e6 with the knight. I can take on e6 with the rook. Or I can make a quiet move, like king g7, with the idea of f5, king f6, and only then take on e6. What would you do? Here white's position is better. It's important to realize that. He has a bishop and a rook against a rook and knight. Now usually as a rule in chess, a bishop and rook are a little bit better than a rook and knight, while incidentally, a queen and knight is usually a little bit better than a queen and bishop. Part of the reason that's so is that a queen and bishop kind of replicate one another, while a queen and knight can have a beautiful harmony in the way they can develop attacks. In this situation though, he has rook and bishop against rook and knight, which is good for him. Also, when you're trying to navigate the differences between bishop and knight, which are both supposedly worth three pawns, the context is very important. One way of navigating it is if it's an open game, usually a bishop will have a little edge. Another thing is that in end games, when play is on both sides of the board, that'll help the bishop out. The reason for this is obvious. A knight can move to all the squares on the board, both light and dark squares, but it takes some time to travel long distances. For example, moving from the king's side all the way to the queen's side is going to be time-consuming, while a bishop can jump from kingside to queenside in one move. So in this situation, white has a queenside majority, and ultimately black will have 
a central and kingside majority. This is a good situation for a bishop usually, because play is on both sides of the board. So here I have to decide. Basically, do I want to play knight against bishop, or rook and knight against rook and bishop? So the two basic solutions are rook takes e6, or knight takes e6. I played rook takes e6, and I'm not convinced this was the best move. You see, another element of this decision is that I want to maximize complications here. Point being, he has a better game. His king is active, his pawns on his majority side are a little bit more advanced, and he has a bishop against a knight. So if I play knight takes e6, I'm keeping more material on the board. We've got even pawns, he's got rook and bishop, I've got rook and knight, but I can mix things up. With the rooks on the board, there's more room for complications. On the other hand, I had a passion for the endgames. You see, I studied the endgame with my teacher, Bruce Pendelfini, very intensely. and I had a lot of confidence on empty boards. I was good at discovering hidden nuances in that kind of game, and you'll see that as this game progresses. So when I played rook takes e6, I felt comfortable with the type of struggle that would be coming. The problem is that it's a little bit too reductive a decision. By that I mean white can reduce the position once more by trading, and then his king comes to e3, and the factors are all really loading up in white's favor. His king can come maybe to e4 to d5 very quickly. This c-pawn can become very dangerous. My king is a little bit loose. If I'd kept rooks on the board, I think I would have a little bit better defensive resources. But my teacher tells me that I was a real nightman as a kid. Apparently I had tremendous skill handling knight maneuvers. I was very confident in this position, even though I knew I was worse. So I played the move rook takes e6. Knight takes e6 was probably a little bit better. Once again, the psychology of the game is so important. My opponent was this intimidating rival. He'd had an advantage all along, and the end game was like a safe house for me. I traded pieces because I was more comfortable there. I was a kid trying to find a way to save the position, and I was looking for a little comfort zone. Once again, we see the importance of the mental tension. The ability to deal with mental tension is so important as a chess player. We can't allow our chess decisions to be based on a psychological need for clarity. And here we feel it. I needed clarity. Knight takes e6 would have kept the complexities alive. It would have given me better defensive resources. After rook takes, rook takes e6, knight takes e6. He played king e3. And now I need to make a plan. I decided to activate my king, king f8. At this point, Jeff was tremendously confident, and everyone who was watching the game on the camera thought that I was in big trouble. And they were right. I have knight against bishop, his king is more active, he's got a very advanced pawn on c4. He ultimately could play the moves a3 and b4 and have these two very powerful pawns, getting ready to shoot all the way down to make a queen. I have to be very precise and very resourceful. He played king e4. I centralize my king, king e8. You have to bring the king into the game in the endgame. And now he played the move g3. You see why? What if he plays king d5? Once again, what did he leave behind? This is a question you'll ask yourself over and over as a chess player. He played the move king e4 to d5. He left the f4 square behind. Knight f4 check. A fork. Going for the g2 pawn. Now if he goes back... I just take on g2 and I've won the pawn. If he plays forward, king c5, with the idea of going after my a5 pawn, after knight takes g2, king b5, I can play the move f5, stopping his bishop from coming into the e4 square. And after king takes a5, e5, we've got a completely wild endgame. I've got central pawns flying up the board, he's going to have queenside pawns flying up the board, my king can defend the queen side to a certain degree, this will be very complicated, but I like my chances. This would have been fun. So he wanted to play king d5, but he wanted to stop knight f4. Put those ideas together, g3. I played king d7. Now if I get one more move, like king d6, my position would be fine. Suddenly I've shielded off his king. I can play the moves king c5, maybe even king b4. I can play actively with my knight to d4, play e5. Now look at this, suddenly black's game is solid. I'm coming into the attack. Unfortunately, there's no time for that. 
He plays the very strong move. What should white play here? Look for an active central move with your king. Here Jeff played the very powerful king d5. A fantastic move. And now white really secures his initiative. You'll also notice that there is a position of mutual zugzwang between his king on d5 and my knight on e6. This idea of zugzwang is a very interesting idea in chess. Basically, it means whoever's move it is will have to make a concession. You see, if my knight on e6 moves anywhere, say to c7 check, then his king can come to c5 and enter my structure. King b6 takes a5. My knight guards the c5 square. And if his king moves, he can't go to c5, he can't go to d4, he can't go to e5, d6 and c6 are covered. If he goes back to e4, then I can play a move like king d6 to c5, and suddenly black is fine, because I've taken over the king position. So here, my knight can't move, and his king can't move. They both hold one another in. So I have to figure out a way to improve my position, while keeping his king on d5. I can't let it get closer to my queen's side pawn. I played the move f5. Another more specific possibility would have been to play knight c7 check, king c5, and then e5, trying to start with an attack. The idea of playing knight e6 to d4, to try to go after his bishop and get my e-pawn rolling. This would have been complicated, possible. I didn't want to do it. Here I kept his king locked into the d5 square, and I played f5. This is a dangerous decision. You see, in general, I've weakened the e5 square very much, and I put my pawns on the color of his bishop. Those can be targets. And now we've reached this position. This is a battle for the national championship between nine-year-old kids. Huge amount of pressure for such young boys. And the battle's just begun. He played a3. We see his idea. He's going to play b4 next and start those pawns rolling. I have to make something happen. I played h6. My idea is to eventually play g5 and f4, start building. Of course, my f5 pawn is attacked by his bishop, so this is just a preparation move. I realize I can't really move my knight on e6 because his king would come to c5, but I'm getting ready for things down the road. Also, my pawn not being on h7 is one less target for his light squared bishop. He played b4. I took on b4. He took on b4, and I played knight c7 check. And he played king c5. Put yourself in my shoes. What should I do? Well, okay. We see that his queenside pawns are getting ready to shoot up. The best defense is a counterattack. I have to start expanding my pawn structure. I played the move e5. His last move, he could have had the option of playing king e5 instead of king c5. This would have stopped this counterplay a little bit, but it would have given less support to his queenside pawns. This might have been the better decision for him, but after king c5, I played e5 trying to counterattack. He played bishop a4 check. What should we do now? I have the active move, king e6, or the defensive move, king c8. What would you do? This active decision plays by some chess principles. The king is active, it's in the middle of the board, it's in the center, that would be one thing. The problem with it is that after king b6, defending the knight, I'm hanging on by a thread. What can white play? Very good. c5, check. The black king is in big trouble. You see the bishop guards the d7 square, the king has to move away, and I lose my knight on c7. Removing the defender, another very important tactical principle. So if I play king d6, we see that c5, check, removes, removes the defender. The e8 square is defended by his bishop. The only other option for my knight is knight a8, check. Now do you see what white can play? Good. King b7. The knight is attacked. It can't move to b6 or c7, the only two legal options, because those squares are both covered by the white king. I'm going to lose the knight, and I'm going to lose the game. As a rule, you can think about the knight as a piece, which is very good in the center of the board. On the, co on the side of the board, on squares like this, it's on the rim 
My first teacher used to tell me a knight on the rim is grim. You don't want the knight on the side of the board. A knight in the corner is at its very worst. It's only got two legal moves. So here, king b7, I lose the knight. So the active looking move, king e6, would have been a big mistake. Move after move after move, if we're defending a bad position, we have to make the best move, the only move sometimes. Keep the battle alive. Bishop a4 check, king c8. He played bishop c6. Now I decided to push my pawn. e4. I'm creating some counterplay. I have to make him worried about something. He played b5, expanding his queenside pawns. You see, his bishop can so easily defend on the king side while attacking on the queen side. If I play a move like e3 after bishop f3, he's defending the e2 square. His bishop is also guarding squares like b7, so it can support the queen side advance. This is the power of the bishop in an endgame, which is taking place on two sides of the board. This is why bishops are usually a little bit better than knight in this kind of endgame. I did play e3. He played bishop f3. And now knight e6 check. I'm generating all the counterplay I can. He played king d5. My teacher used to always tell me, reverse the move order. You see, if you go back two moves, if I had played knight e6 check first, he couldn't have played king d5. After king d5, e3, you see his king has blocked his bishop's defense of the f3 square. Suddenly he can't stop my e3 pawn, and I'm winning the game. So, if I had played knight e6, king d5, e3, king takes e6, e2, that's very good for me. I'm waking a queen and I'm going to win that position. So after knight e6, he would have had to play king d6. And then I have the d4 square to play with. I can either play e3 here, or knight d4, and then e3. Generates a little bit more counterplay. I should have reversed the move order. I played e3, bishop f3, knight e6 check, king d5. Now I went after his bishop, knight g5. He played bishop e2. One thing you should recognize about the knight is that when it's diagonally away from another square with one square in between, for example the knight and this pawn, there's one square in between, it looks close, but in fact it takes that knight four squares to get there. For example, knight e4 to f6, to g4, to e3. So this knight is four moves away from that pawn on e3. That's a long way. That pawn is vulnerable. Of course I realized that. What my idea was, was to hopefully give away that pawn and get my king to the c5 square. Gain some kind of blockade. Now his pawns are on the same color square of his bishop, which means they're well defended, but he can never get to the dark squares. This would give me good drawing chances. That was my idea. I played king c7, and now he played king e5. He wants to go to f6, to g6, to take my pawn, to eat up all my kingside pawns. But this was a small mistake. He gave me a chance here, and I felt it. I remember the feeling well. My skin perked up. I realized, wait a minute, there's something here. Let's put things together. Okay, we know he has a dominant position. My pawn on e3 is very vulnerable. It's going to get lost because my knight can't defend it. It's just too far away. He has the queenside pawn majority. This is a big thing, because if I get all consumed with dealing with these pawns, he can take my pawns on the king's side. He has an active king. My king is purely defensive. He has a bishop against a knight. His bishop can cover the king's side and the queen's side in the center all at once. On the other hand, I do have some things working for me. One thing in particular, and when you're defending this kind of position, you have to be as resourceful as possible. I recognize one element of this equation. A typical way of converting this kind of endgame advantage for the dominant player, in this case white, is to eventually give up all the pawns in one direction to take all the pawns in another direction. But what I realized is that his h-pawn, and this might seem insignificant now, this pawn right here, is actually on the wrong color for his bishop. What do I mean by this? Well, let's imagine that we've reached a position like this. Let's say I've given up my knight for his remaining pawn. And what he's left with is an h-pawn, a bishop, and a king. This looks completely winning. The trick is that this is a winning position. 
And this is a drone position. And understanding that kind of idea, it can give you a beacon to aim for. Let me show you why. Here, inevitably, I'm going to get to the corner. That's where I have to go. And that's where my drawing chances remain. So let's say I play king f7, he plays h4, and my king goes to g7. If my king can't get to the corner of the board, obviously I'm losing. If his king could ever get to g7 to shoulder my king away, I'm finished. But if my king can get to the h8 square, then there's no way he can ever get me out. His king comes up here, his bishop can go wherever on the board it wants to, doesn't matter how much he moves. His pawn comes up. In this position, it's stalemate if it's my move. My king can't go to g8, h7, or g7. It's my move. I have no legal moves, and I'm not in check. This is a draw. This is stalemate. If it's his move, if he makes a move like bishop f5, I go to g8. If he moves bishop to e4, I go back to h8. I go back and forth, back and forth. If he plays h7 check, I go to h8. Now, if he moves his king to h6, it's stalemate once again. My king has no legal moves. If his king goes back to g5 or h5, taking away the stalemate reality, I just go back to g7. Now I'm guarding the h8 square, so we can't make a queen. He moves, and I move back. Back and forth. Back and forth. If he ever comes up to f6, it's stalemate. h6, stalemate. g6, stalemate. His bishop can never kick me out of the corner, and this is a drawn endgame. Now, you remember I said if his bishop had been on d2, it would be winning. Why is that? Well, let's look towards the end of the game again. King f7, he moves his pawn up. I head for the corner. He brings his king in. And now when we reach this position, back and forth, now white wins very easily. He just plays h7 check, king h8, and bishop c3 is checkmate. The bishop is on the right corner. So, in this kind of situation, if I can recognize that if his bishop is on e2, it's a draw. If his bishop is on d2, then he's winning. If he can control the queening square of a pawn that's on the rook file, it's winning for him. If he cannot control the queening square, meaning in this case the h8 square, then it's a draw. So, that's something that I can recognize going back to this position. So if we look here, if I can get my king to blockade these pawns, if I can somehow pick them off eventually, and if I can get rid of this g3 pawn, then I can sacrifice my knight for these two pawns over here. Race my king to the corner, and even if he takes all of my pawns, I can draw the game. This is the kind of thing we have to recognize. If we're defending a losing position, we have to see every little last chance we have. And in order to do that, of course, we have to have clarity of mind, we have to be calm, we can't get caught up in the downward spiral like I did in my game against David Arnett. If we maximize our chances, often we can save losing games. Now, of course, I want to make one last point. Let's imagine we have a position like this. In this kind of situation, I can't take the pawn on g3 because now he would take h takes g3. If the pawn is on the knight file, bishop, king, queen, bishop, or knight file, and the B, C, D, E, F, G, or H files, he's winning regardless of what color his bishop is. His pawn can simply come down, and when we reach this kind of final position, there's no stalemate option. His bishop can check me. I move any queens. Or, if his bishop here, for example, is of a dark square, he can just make a move. And then, when I move here, it's checkmate. And if I move here, he can play g7, king g8, and his bishop can move again. He can just use the bishop to waste time. If my bishop were off the board and it was white's move, king g6, the only move to defend the pawn would be stalemate. With the bishop on the board, bishop goes back to c3, king h7, king f7, and next move will be g8 queen. So the only way this works is with an h-pawn, a rook-pawn, an h-pawn or an a-pawn. Okay, let's go back. I played knight e4, king d4, king d6. 
I've succeeded in blockading him a little bit. He played king takes e3, king c5, just where I wanted to go. Once again, I've given up a little bit of material to achieve my blockade. Now we know, as a distant goal, if I can get rid of these three pawns, I can save it. Here he played the move g4. An indicator that maybe my opponent doesn't realize this thing. Now this isn't so much of a bad move. I have ideas. I can play knight d6 back to e4, back and forth. I can slowly play moves like g5, shouldering his king away. You see, he can never kick my king off of the c5 square. So what he has to do is figure out how to play on the king's side. This was part of my plan. I've created a blockade successfully, and I can wait. Him playing g4 is good in that he has the idea of opening up some weaknesses on my king's side. If, for example, he can make this trade, he can then play king f4, takes f5. It's not so simple for me to get rid of these two pawns with my knight. Why is that? Well, let's imagine this position. If I play knight d6, I can't take on b5 because he can take with my pawn. If knight takes c4, you see what, how white can win here? Bishop takes c4. And then if king takes c4, suddenly my king is behind the race of the b-pawn. b6 to b7 to b8 queen, I can't catch up. So in fact, his bishop guarding this one square on c4 guards both of these pawns. This is his idea. It's very important to do this kind of visualization work when you're playing an endgame. You have to see, okay, if this happens in general, what's his plan? If that happens in general, what's my plan? I want to aim for this. Okay, I understand that. Then you can make the tactics go in the direction of what you've figured out strategically. First you make your plan, then you figure out how to make it happen. So when Jeff played g4, what he realized is that if he creates a kingside weakness, his bishop alone might be able to guard the c4 and b5 pawns, make his king run to the kingside, and win the game. g4 actually looks like a winning move. I played knight d6. My idea with that, of course, is I can't take on g4 because my knight would be hanging. My pawn is defending my knight on e4. That would be removing the defender of my knight. By playing knight d6, I free up my pawn to take on g4. He played king f4. Everyone in the audience thought I was completely losing in this position. But I had the sense that maybe there was something. g5 check. King e5. Now I played f takes g4, and he played king f6. He can't take on g4 because then his pawn goes. On c4 I can play knight takes c4 check, and then I take on b5, and then I can draw the game. His plan all along, though, was to play king f6. You see, what Jeff's idea was, was his bishop can always hold these pawns. His king can ultimately win all my kingside pawns. If he can just simply play king there, king takes, king takes, king takes, and he's cleaned up the house, his h-pawn will run up the board. My king is stuck on the queen side defending these things, and my knight can never actually take one, because again, if we do that, then I end up behind his b-pawn. So that was Jeff's thinking. Can we think one move deeper? Here I want you to do this calculation with me. I have to find my chance. I played g5 check, king e5, f takes g4. Now I'm going to show you a few more moves, and then I'm going to return to this last position and let you calculate from there. He played king f6, and I played the move g3, an excellent resource. He played h takes g3, knight e4 check, King g6, knight takes g3. We had both calculated to this position. And after bishop d3, Jeff thought he was winning the game. Now let's go back. Okay, so that's what you need to evaluate. So from this position, I'm going to say the moves, you're going to calculate in your head, and then I want you to find the best move. g5 check. King e5. f takes g4, king f6, 
G3. A good tactical move, trading off that final pawn. H takes G3. Knight E4 check. King G6. Knight takes G3. And Bishop D3. This is the position that Jeff, me, the whole audience, everyone calculated to. Everyone thought that I was losing. Except in this position here, in front of you now, when I play g5, I saw the next move. And I saw that I actually had some interesting defensive resource. You see, the idea of the relationship between bishop and knight is that a bishop separated from a knight in this way A bishop and a knight relating to one another like this is a completely dominant position for the bishop. You see here, the knight can't move anywhere. In this situation, the knight can't move anywhere forward. In this situation, the bishop guards all these squares. Here, the bishop traps the knight in. Every square is covered. Same in this way. So if you have this kind of exercise, if the, bishop, if the knight is here, and you ask, what is white's best move? The bishop comes here, traps the knight in. That was what Jeff saw. So, once again, when I make the decision to play g5 check, I have to evaluate that in that final position, I'm okay. So now, I want you to take some time. Not 30 seconds or a minute. Take 3 minutes, 4 minutes, 5 minutes, maybe even 10 minutes. Try very hard. Stretch your brain. That's what will make you better as a chess player. In this situation, Calculate, reach that final position, and then see if you can figure out a way for me to have a defensive resource. Again, let me go through the variation with you. G5 check, king e5, f takes g4, king f6, g3, h takes g3, knight e4, king g6, knight takes g3, bishop d3, black to move. Remember, our Point to the square I have to go to for the key save, but do it from here. Fantastic. That's the right move. And it's the move that Jeff missed. It's counterintuitive, moving to the corner. This relationship between bishop and knight is completely dominant. And often, we're trapped by the maxims that we know. In this situation, we've learned from the very beginning of our chess play that a knight should never go to the corner of the board. So what can happen is that we can have a blind spot in our calculation. We can never look for a knight going to the corner of the board. It becomes something we're just blind to. We don't see it whenever it's there. Here, Jeff, a very strong chess player and an incredible calculator, didn't see the move knight h1 because it was too counterintuitive. That's the move I had to find and that you had to find. So congratulations. Okay, you didn't see it. Take a look at it from this position. This was the position on the board. It's Black's move. You see it now? I can't move my H-pawn because my G-pawn goes. If I play a move like G4, he just takes my H-pawn, then my G-pawn. My king can't do anything useful because if it moves to D4, then B6 will make a queen. If it goes back, nothing happens. He just takes on H6. And my knight is trapped. But there's one square. Knight to the corner. H1. A counterintuitive decision. A blind spot that Jeff had. The knight moves to the corner of the board. Then he can jump back into the board on F2. Of course, the key is to find this move 10 moves ago. When I played G5 check. That was the challenge. Knight H1. Jumping to the corner of the board, a fantastic resource. King takes h6, g4. King g5, I push the pawn once again. Now my idea at this point is to overload the bishop, make the bishop defend the g2 square. He plays bishop e4, and now what do you do? All I have to do is get rid of these pawns, but once again, taking this pawn would be a terrible mistake because b6 followed by b7, b8, queen. Once again, we see the power of the bishop versus the knight, 
The knight is so far away from this pawn, it can never get there. The bishop can go back and forth handling kingside and queenside at once. But the knight has fantastic resources also. Knight f2, attacking the bishop. Bishop d5. Once again, it looks like maybe Jeff has got it. He can play king f4, takes g3. The bishop guards the g2 square. The bishop is guarded by the c4 pawn, and it guards the c4 pawn. Once again, I move my knight to a counterintuitive square, to the back rank, to save the game. Knight d1. In truth, this should still be part of the initial calculation. Knight d1, king goes to f4, and the knight goes to c3. Now it looks like I can really save this game. Jeff played bishop to c6. And now I played knight e2 check, attacking the king and defending my pawn. He plays king f3. And I play knight d4 check. The knight jumps all over the board, and now I can save the game. King takes g3. Knight takes bishop on c6. B takes c6. Which pawn should I take? Yes, that's the right pawn. I have to take the more advanced pawn. King f3, king c5, king e3, king takes c4, and I've saved the game. Two kings are left on the board. It's all over. It's a draw. And I won the national championship.